All right. But why don't we move on? The next, um, we're now going to move into the, uh, the first of three concept clearances. And the first one is by Elise Feingold on the future of ENCODE. And I just want to say that Didi Meldrum is on the phone uh, from uh, Lyon, France. Is, uh, is there anybody else who's on the phone? OK. OK, so I'm going to give um, uh, a summary of the concept clearance we have for three RFAs for ENCODE. Um, hopefully, you'll have good context for these um, after my talk this morning. So the first RFA, uh, well, first of all, I want to say that we had um, planning, uh, we had input from several planning meetings. The first was on the genomics of gene regulation planning meeting as part of the broader planning for the uh, next strategic plan. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we had an external consultants panel in the course review of the ENCODE and MOD ENCODE projects last April. And uh, then we had a lot of relevant discussion at the uh, Early House uh, strategic planning meeting last July. So um, to summarize the, the collective input, there was recognition that after the projects, the modern code and encode projects are finished, we'll only have interrogated a small fraction of the cell states uh, in the organism. So the long-term goal of completing the catalog of functional elements uh, was felt to still be a priority for NHGRI. We had to think about the, the fact that the data needs to be generated at a reasonable cost and in a reasonable time frame, and we need to consider what work requires a consortium infrastructure versus what can be done um, in uninitiated uh, work, uh, investigator initiated work for the community. Um, we, there was a recognition that current technologies were not sufficiently robust to really totally completely complete the catalogs. Um, there were some limitations in reagents. And there was also a need for enhancing data analysis activities. So we, we use this collective input in, in developing these initiatives that we're going to be talking about now. Um, I should also say that at the February Council, we addressed one of these limitations, the concept clearance in technology development. And Michael Payson gave a uh, concept clearance that was approved um, to talk about um, R01 and R21 pilot projects for improving the sensitivity and cost of uh, being able to identify functional elements and also stimulate uh, development of better uh, methods for high throughput biological validation. So that addresses one, one of the issues that was raised. Um, so uh, these next RFAs are uh, moving forward with the rest of the program. The first is on expanding the encyclopedia of DNA elements in the human and model organisms. So in, in uh, constructing this uh, plan, we were uh, taking into account several goals that, that uh, we thought were important. And the first is that we felt there was a need to balance technology development with, with continued data production. We feel that in our experience is that it's important to have both technology development and production that fuels, um, fuels progress. Uh, we wanted to um, expand the code projects to generate as complete catalogs as is feasible with the, uh, in the, um, with the current technologies, limitations of current technologies. We really wanted to capitalize on the progress that has been made in establishing high throughput and efficient production pipelines through the support of centralized uh, production uh, efforts to take advantage of economies of scale, centralized management, and centralized coordination. And, and so in this uh, initiative, we really wanted to focus in, uh, um, focus some of the data production and analysis efforts to really maximize the utility of the resources and thinking about the most useful data sets to collect. So um, the proposed scope of, of the uh, expanded in code would be uh, a big emphasis on continuing annotation of the human genome. This was felt to be a very high payoff project, useful for the community. Um, there's a lot of new RNA data that's now available um, that will uh, fuel the continued annotation of the human genome. Uh, we also wanted to expand this to annotation of the mouse genome, since this uh, has proved so important for the uh, human project. We also wanted to ex uh, expand the repertoire of data types in the code particular emphasis on more classes of RNA molecules and functional elements within RNA molecules for the human and mouse genomes. It was uh, clearly when, when the uh, ENCODE project started four years ago, uh, we did not have as a good appreciation of the different classes of RNA molecules that we do now, and so we feel this is an important area to expand in. Um, th then we also wanted to take existing data sets more deeply in the human genome with more limited studies in um, the model organisms uh, fly. Uh, a worm and, and the mouse. And these deeper studies um, 
would include um, mapping binding sites for all transcription factors using at least two cell types for each new factor. This is a really large, um, big limiting step in ENCODE is, is getting uh, reagents to map the, uh, all the different transcription factors. And so we felt that if we, can, if we can get at least some information, at least on two cell types for each factor, that will go a long way in, in increasing our knowledge of, um, of the binding sites and, and fu finding functional elements. We wanted to go deeper in cell lines, um, cell types, mapping additional site, mapping sites for open chromatin, mapping selected histone marks, and other relevant chromatin uh, proteins, also more cell types, and then uh, mapping sites of DNA methylation in additional cell types. In terms of the genomes to be studied, uh, we feel it's important to have a primary emphasis on the human genome, secondary uh, emphasis on the mouse genome, and have a reduced emphasis on uh, C. elegans and Drosophila melanogaster genomes. The, uh, the fly and worm projects, the modern code projects, have been very successful, as I discussed this morning. Um, we recognize that they are not complete at this point, but we feel that they've provided a firm foundation for the research community that now actually has um, uh, there's much broader access in the community to the different technologies that are being used, and we feel that, that individuals can now, um, uh, they have the ability to ask more biologically focused questions with these technologies, and so that we feel there's a reduced need for consortium infrastructure. And we'd like to actually use the modern code catalogs and the model organisms to, um, for the next questions we want to ask about interactions of functional elements and the regulation of gene expression, and Peter is going to talk a little bit more about that in the next concept clearance. So we still think there's um, a, a lot we can use these model organisms for, um, but we'd like to shift the emphasis of those a bit. So that's the first RFA. The second RFA is a data analysis and coordination center for ENCODE. And um, we'd like to support a single centralized database to serve as a data coordination and analysis center. So um, this would be uh, the data coordination involves um, uh, housing and maintaining the databases to track and store um, and provide access to ENCODE data. We want to provide informatics resource um, to ensure consistent data analysis and to facil facilitate integrative analyses and to work with the ENCODE's um, analysis working group to identify the types of analyses needed to perform all necessary data transformations. And so what we're doing here is actually consolidating efforts. There was um, a data coordination center for ENCODE, data coordination center for modern code, data analysis center for uh, ENCODE and Data Analysis Center for Modern Code. So there's four activities that we're now condensing, um, proposing to condense into one, um, which we feel should, should result in operational efficiencies. And um, one of the things that has been uh, important to us, but we haven't really uh, stressed enough, is the analysis goal of trying to define what we're calling a minimum set of elements or marks that are needed to identify a unique molecular signature of the cell to optimize data generation by ENCODE, and as well as other related projects. There's a lot of interest in disease studies in generating all this omics data, and we'd like to actually provide some guidance as to what are, are the most um, powerful um, uh, uh, data sets that can be generated, and, and uh, because we realize this will be very costly for all the different studies that are uh, going to be undertaken. And if there's any way we can help streamline that, um, we thought that uh, we would like to try to do that through the ENCODE analysis. And then the third RFA is computational analysis of, the, uh, of ENCODE data. And this is um, sort of a new idea. We like to enhance data analysis activities beyond the ENCODE participants. And this is something that we've heard um, from our advisors, uh, various working groups, that we really want to make sure this data gets out to the community and that people are using it. We like to bring additional people into uh, looking at ENCODE Data. So we wanted to support individual research projects to use ENCODE data for studies that um, may uh, combine ENCODE data with related functional genomics data to drive new biological insights, to use ENCODE data to improve on the analysis of disease mapping studies, and also develop new methods to improve on the analysis and interpretation of ENCODE data. Uh, this slide outlines the uh, mechanisms of support and proposed budgets for these three initiatives, the first one under the ENCODE um, production. Uh, we'd like to continue the uh, U54 Cooperative Agreement Center mechanism. We're proposing somewhere between 15 and 25 million dollars in total cost per year for four years. Um, this contrasts to the approximately 33 million dollars that we're spending now in modern code and ENCODE. And uh, we're anticipating, depending upon this uh, level of funding, somewhere between six and eight awards. And we'd certainly like your, your input on, on, um, on this uh, target number. Uh, the second RFA, uh, the Data Analysis and Coordination Center, 
uh, we'd like to support through the U41 cooperative agreement mechanism and putting in approximately three and a half million dollars total cost per year for four years and, and we anticipate making one award. And um, lastly, the computational analysis of ENCODE data. This will be a U, U01 uh, cooperative agreement mechanism uh, and uh, we've set aside three million dollars total cost for three years and anticipate six to ten awards. Uh, I believe that was it. Yes, yeah, so um, I forget those numbers. It's about five million now, I think. Per year, it's about 1.5 for the data coordinating center, about 1.3 for the data analysis center. For that, that's, that's for per year. That's for, that's for human, yeah. right, Peter? That's for human. Right. Um, and and, and, and same for mouse. about the same for mouse. Mouse is covered by the human. No, center. I'm sorry. Modern code is about modern the same. Modern code is for about the same. Code. That's total. total. So one question certainly is whether this is enough. Um, I mean, we'd certainly like your your input on on that. Can can I just ask how you envision the distribution of responsibility or activity between the data analysis and coordination center and the computational analysis of the encyclopedia. So the second two, they, they there are, is an, there's an overlap between mm -hmm. the charges for the second two groups. Mm -hmm. And I'm just curious how you're going to manage that overlap. I'll start and then I'll let Peter um, Correct me. Um, so these are uh, the the RFA for these UO1s is really meant to augment the analysis activities that are going to be supported through the Data Analysis Center. The Data Analysis Center um, does a lot of activities that uh, that really organize the analyses, that um, organize the data, that help uh, working with the analysis working group to identify what what analysis should be done. Um, but I'm going to turn this over to Peter, and he could he could expand on that. Um, I, I view the data analysis and coordination center as responsible for doing the work that's required to generate the ENCODE product, uh, being the derived data that the community will use, and an initial integrative analysis of this data to show that the power of, of what is being used. And this is going to be run not necessarily by the data analysis and coordination center, but it will be part of the analysis working group, and it's the analysis working group which represents all of the production centers um, and the DAC, um, the, the DACC, that will do these types of analysis. Whereas I view the third part, the, this analysis, the other analysis centers, as, as, as not being as tied necessarily to being responsible for generating a product, but to do analysis of where you can take that and go further with it. Um, either by, by combining it with disease data sets or by just methods development, which may feed back into the, the analysis working group, but it may not. It, they're not as tied to this idea of a, a generating a product of what we think that ENCODE should be. Claire? I'm assuming that the um, 15 to $25 million that you have under the first um, initiative there is what you believe you need to complete this project. And you use complete a couple of times in your slides in quotations. Mm -hmm. And so I just, I just, it would be helpful, I think, if you could clarify what, what, your, what you mean when you say complete. And um, do you think that the technology has, has reached a point where it would be necessary to have this amount of money devoted for four years, or is there the possibility that you could get to completion sometime before the end, or the end of four years, and shift some of that money into the computational analysis? Because I I see that as being um, a particularly exciting aspect of this whole concept clearance, and that, and it just looks like if you're contemplating six to ten awards, three million dollars per year, that's not a whole lot of money. Mm -hmm. Right. I, I think it's very hard to predict how close to completion we're going to be in, in four years from now. I think that um, we're certainly working towards that, but I think we're going to have to come up with, with a working definition of, of, of complete and uh, know that we're not going to really get there. I think the big challenge for ENCODE is, is, is um, probing 
enough different data set, data, um, I'm sorry, tissue types, really getting to uh, to single cell analysis, which is something we're pushing in the technology RFA. Um, but I and I think it, it really depends on the scope of what we end up, up funding. Um, I think you can uh, you can be as wide as you want to be with all of these different elements, and that's why we're hoping the analysis will drive down uh, and give us this this idea of what a minimum set might be. What what's the what are the most important elements to be to be probing? But I think that's something we're going to be working on is is trying to define a reasonable endpoint. Rex. Um, so so as I understand, you're trying to um, roll the human and model mod encode it to, together. Mm -hmm. um, can you just talk a little bit about how you imagine that to scale uh, proportionally and could you talk about whether there are any sort of cultural differences between the two communities that might make that more complicated? Yeah, so I think part of um, our, our uh, non-specificity of, of how we're going to do that right now depends on, on how much money we have. That will certainly determine how much we're able to, to fund in, in modern code versus in code. Our, our feeling is that um, there's uh, so much biology that the, that the model organism communities can now do with the technologies and with the data that they have that that's, we've really reduced the amount that we're going to, to fund for these large consortium um, activities. We haven't put a specific number on it, but it's going to be uh, a very small fraction compared to, compared to ENCODE which will be unpopular, I'm sure. <laughs> and I would say that I think that we need to find those activities that are best done in a consortium mm -hmm. um, and focus on those very high priority activities. Um, and then, as Elise has pointed out, I think that the model organism communities, they actually want to do a lot of this in their own lab because they want to do it on their, their strain background. Mm -hmm. um, and it, this, this data may help to some extent, but in the end, they, they'll become limited. And just to expand on that point, I think the, the types of data we're thinking about being very uh, useful would be those that can increase the quality of, of the data set and um, also fill in gaps. Mike? So, Lisa, as following up on Howard's question, um, that the total, it sounds like, is sort of a 40 percent cut for data analysis and coordinating center activity. Um, and so I was curious, do you think that's going to come from the efficiencies of going from four down to one, or are things sufficiently reduced to practice for the two projects that there's less to sort of develop in terms of approaches? Or wh where do you see that as coming from? Because this does run counter to some of the things we've been saying earlier on today in terms of more funds for, for analysis and computation. Right, yeah. We, d we do worry that that might not be, be enough. And uh, Peter, do you want to respond? So I think there will be some economies of scale because if you think about what mod encode and encode support, they support somewhere on the order of 20 PIs and they also support I don't know how many co-PIs. And you, you talk to the DCCs and they struggle. It, it's, the, it's the slide I showed earlier on the data management talk. It's this submission process that is really time consuming and which is driving a lot of their costs. So by having only six to eight producers making sure these are large producers and not fragmented. Um, I think will drive the number of submitters down. Um, I, I, I share Elisa's view that we, we are concerned about this and we seek counsel's advice. Given that uh, no matter how, how much effort is put in, this is still in some ways just scraping the surface. And, and you mentioned that uh, you know, uh, the communities around model organisms are interested in taking this up. To what extent Will there be an emphasis here on um, on uh, packaging the, the knowledge uh, of how to do this in a way that makes the methods more accessible to these communities so that it can be taken up uh, very, very efficiently? It seems to me the technologies themselves now are so scalable, it is feasible, as you mentioned, for smaller labs to do this. To what extent will the aim here be to enable that? Well, one of the activities that um, are uh, ongoing now with ENCODE and Modern Code working together are to develop community standards for uh, RNA-seq, for CHIP-seq, and um, uh, re really uh, describing what in our consortium's experiences have been in, uh, in testing out different sequencing depths, um, peak callers, those, t those types of things. And so that's a very important part of what we want to accomplish here. Um, and I think certainly by this, uh, this last RFA, um, 
by bringing in additional people using that, we, we think this will be one way of disseminating um, the, uh, at least the analysis of, of, of the data. If you have any other suggestions of, of how we can make this data more useful to the community, we'd be very happy to hear that. Dave? Uh, Elise, you pointed out in your talk this morning how many GWAS hits uh, hit into these areas, and that makes me wonder if uh, you're going to be able to do cost sharing. Could you do cost sharing with disease, uh, you know, with other institutes that have their suite of diseases? Mm -hmm. So in terms of doing no normal tissues then, or, or? Well, in terms of funding additional work that um, mm -hmm. makes it clearer how all this regulation works. We, we certainly. Uh, can, can have dialogues with, with other institutes for this. I mean, what, what we're hoping to do is actually to, to um, as I said before, help, help those researchers figure out what the minimum set of data would be. Um, and that should help cut down the cost in some, some respects for these disease studies. But we can certainly have dialogues. I know that uh, Terry Minolio and other, other people have been, been talking with, with other institutes about possibilities for partnerships. We can explore that further. My, my guess is that <clears throat> we are not going to be able to get other institutes to contribute to the development of the fundamental resource, but that if they, there are projects that they want to initiate, disease-specific projects that they want to initiate on, that, that use these approaches and want to apply the, these approaches in their particular situation, then, then we could uh, either collaborate, maybe even cost share, but uh, certainly help advise them on doing that. Does anyone? So this, all right. This is Dee Dee here. Can I ask a question? Go ahead, Dee. Can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. I didn't know if it was a good time or not. The video is it's lagging perfect. behind. <laughs> Uh, so, when we discussed this in February, uh, Initiative 1 was about technology development and seemed to include the opportunity to have technology development and innovation, although it did say one possibility under consideration is that there would be to do the completion of the ENCODE with limitations of current technology, and it seems that that's what has been implemented here in this concept clearance. Uh, in the first one listed, and I'll state it at the beginning, that it, to do it within the limitations of current technology. So will you entertain uh, innovative new technology development projects in this, or they will be excluded? There's going to be a separate initiative for technology that we discussed in the February Council. But uh, the, the grantees for that uh, will certainly be encouraged to work with the grantees under um, under ENCODE. I see. Okay. So I, I realized, yeah, that's a different one. Okay. I just wanted to make sure about that. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> now we're in the dark. Dave. Um, the other point I, I'd like to make is I just think it's a great idea to push the mouse in this, as it sounds like you are going to do, because you can just do a lot more perturbations in the mouse uh, than you can in and it's in vivo rather than in some cultured cell, so I just think it's great. Does anyone have any other comments about the budget level for um, the first RFA? Do you have ideas about how you want to distribute that between human and mice? I think we're uh, <coughs> going to really have to see what applications we, we get in. But but as I mentioned earlier this morning, our, our our, um, the primary emphasis will be on human, with a secondary emphasis on mouse. Howard? Uh, please, please don't take the silence as we're happy with that amount of money. It's just that we listened when Eric talked this morning. <laughs> so, I mean, that's, yes. you do what you can. But, but I think if, if there is a general opinion that this this is uh, a modest amount of money for what's um, uh, been outlined. Then that's worth having on the record whether we can implement it or not. It's like a modest amount of money for what's been uh, proposed. 
But then you can ask the same question about the second RFA. So we've alluded to the fact that there may not be enough. Would the recommendation of council be that this be increased? I, I'm, I am worried about, you know, you're, you're putting four groups, I mean, in principle, four groups together. You've said maybe the model part of it's going to get sort of de-emphasized. So m maybe maybe that's okay, but, you know, um, and if you try to think of this as a, a bucket of money and, and you're just moving things around, um, it, does, it does worry me that you're putting a lot of emphasis for the success of this project on one group and you need to make sure they have the resources, especially as you think about, you know, the problem that you alluded to earlier in your first presentation about, you know, data coming in, there's still a lot of connections that are going to need to be made, presumably. And and especially since this has been handled by four groups in the past, there's going to be the fundamental problem of how do you bring those four groups into alignment. Ross? So uh, along those lines, there, there was a uh, we were talking earlier about you know, trying to get other institutes to buy in, and, and we've all recognized that individual labs can do the kind of work that's outlined there in the first part, and, and many, many are. Uh, to be really useful, all those data need to be available, and it's better if they're in the same place. It's really better if they've been subjected to common standards and quality controls and all of that. Now, was there the thought, or at least it seems to me, <laughs> in an ideal world, the uh, the data analysis and coordinating center could handle not only the the encode stuff, but the encode relevant things from other investigators. And if that were to be part of the idea you definitely need to dial up that money big time. Okay. One more comment? Well, I, I think you mentioned it, uh, just to follow up on that, you, in your earlier presentation, you, there was three presentations from ENCODE and 20 from non-ENCODE mm -hmm. at, at mm -hmm. one of the representative meetings you put up there. Um, and, and so it sounds like there is a lot of, the potential for a lot of data. Mm -hmm to be generated out of R01s, out of foundation money, out of whatever other mm -hmm. source. And so if if that becomes one of the goals, which I, think, which I think it is a good one to have, then that will have to be dialed up appropriately. I think having one place, certainly we've seen in, in other networks where um, one place allows you to, allows them to say no a little bit easier. And so certain types of data mm -hmm. just don't go in the database anymore mm -hmm. because if mom says no, then you go to dad if there's two, you know, okay. Whereas in this case, there's only one parent. Mm -hmm. um, and, but, it, but I think um, you, you also do need to be able to accommodate all the other aunts and uncles or cousins or whatever you want to, analogy you want to make. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, so is it fair to summarize this discussion by saying that as we move along in developing this and as we, <clears throat> um, the, the resources that might be available come into clearer focus, if we ended up with uh, deciding to put more money into the production RFA or more money into the DACC or a different proportion of the two than we've outlined here, council would not be um, feel betrayed. Okay. Uh, I, I'm not sure I understood what you said, but <laughs> let me <laughs> let, let, let me let me try this. So so. I think what I heard was maybe if you needed to move some from production into the coordinating center in order to get um, an appropriately meaty activity there, um, I think council, my, my sense was that council would be behind that. I'm not sure council would be behind going the other direction. No, but would also if more funds were to become available so that we could or we decided to put a larger proportion of extramural funds into this activity, increasing both with, within reason. Council wouldn't, I mean, there was an exp, uh, the, the uh, opinion that maybe 15 to 25 million for the production RFA might not be enough. So 
I heard the, the uh, indication of a certain amount of flexibility there too. But if is and in parallel, is there some plan um, for maybe not an RFA, but an RFP kind of thing to bring in more R01 requests for some of the smaller groups to participate? Is that part of the? Would that could that be potentially part of the plan? Well, I think that's what the third. So that's more focused on analysis. So, I mean, we've always opened oh, code. You're talking into production? Yeah. We've always opened code up, but it's there's the question of what's the benefit to the small users to join and, and to provide their data. So that, that's the challenge. Um, I, I guess what I'm saying, I guess what I'm saying, Rex, is that it's always difficult to make legit, uh, good recommendations about funding levels when you're talking about ice programs in isolation. So that ultimately we're going to have to do this in terms of the overall program and addressing all priorities. But I just didn't hear a um, uh, strong feeling that we should necessarily be constrained precisely by the numbers we, we gave here. Mark, can I just say that it would be helpful for me, and I think a few of us to see some of these numbers in the context of the extramural program in general. And, and if you're contemplating shifting numbers, to know a little bit more about how that affects maybe R01s, et cetera. Right. We've uh, sort of periodically presented that kind of analysis to council. We haven't done it probably in, uh, in two years, maybe. So we should do that. Right. I just want to say that I mentioned that that this even the twenty five million dollars is a considerable decrease from what's currently uh, invested in code in modern code production. Ross, did you want to say something? Well, um, back to the, this uh, uh, um, the, the fact that that uh, many institutes in their extramural program are funding research along these lines. And, and we see the papers coming out, and, and we'd love to have the data as easily well, <laughs> as easily available uh, and actually subjected to, to quality standards as was uh, going on in ENCODE. And I, I know you, you're, you're, that these cl concept clearances didn't really get into it, but I um, just as we were talking about what the, the DAC could be doing, uh, we do. It would be very beneficial to the community to have. A repository for the data being generated from many other uh, investigators, and I was really expanding the the, the umbrella. Uh, and um, well, and it actually harkens back to, to a lot of discussions we were having earlier today about that the, the the data handling, data storage, and so forth. Uh, and this is um, if. If this initiative could, uh, uh, yeah, oh yeah, M maybe the, sh uh, uh, we'll, 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 we'll get to another one of my, my concerns, but we've used the term completeness more than once, and, and I think this next project will, will get, I don't want to talk about it until he's gone through through this, but everyone would love to have co completeness, uh, and if you have more data coming in from a wider community, you're much more likely to approach something that, that, that might be considered complete or at least useful. So I, I would really love to see uh, support for uh, bringing in the data, making it easier for people to, to submit their data. Oh, Peter, you were saying, why would anybody want to join uh, uh, the, the ENCODE consortium You know, if they aren't funded by it? And uh, that's true. but. It, if we made it easy for people who are generating these data to get the data in, and, and people use it, I mean, we are judged also by how well our, our data are used. I think it would be a real positive. At any rate, the that, that more information you can get into one place, the better your analyses can be, the more complete the, the, the integrative analyses will be. So what I'm, this is a long-winded way of saying I would really like to see that second initiative expanded. So, and with plenty of support for it. Going, going back to my earlier talk, what you're basically saying is you want this ENCODE DACC to be a data broker for all functional genomics, related to ENCODE. 
I wish I could have been that concise. Thank you. <laughs> but, but I guess now I'm slightly confused because you also showed in your talk, you, you emphasized the fact that the operational costs of interacting with large numbers of groups could or would make a lot that's, of these that's, things. As, as a data broker, you would have to. Very expensive. Yes. And yet the reason we were trying to do it this way was to reduce the number of production groups to reduce the cost of, of intaking all that data. But if we then go out and make that same group now almost like, I mean, a data broker, I mean, that's a huge response, a, a whole bunch of R01 investigators, then you're going to be trading off what they can do with their dollars relative to the funded encode groups versus non-encode groups. I mean, you would have to give them more, you have to give them more money, but also since they're dealing with the same type of data, um, they, it, the data broker would be easier than just saying, just my first response to Ross says, isn't that what GEO is for? Um, and, but you're right, you, you do need a certain amount of data brokering to make sure the data is in the right formats, the quality values are, are clearly indicated, et cetera, et cetera. The, the added complication is all those other R01 projects are not um, uh, under the same data release standards as the ENCODE projects are. But, but, but even, if they, uh, even if the data are not put into the repository until they're published, it's still a good thing to have the data in the repositories. Yeah, I, I mean, I think Peter said it. Isn't that what GEO is for? So then the decision is, well, is GEO, it, are the requirements for putting your data in GEO sufficient in terms of metadata and other things? Would this be a, a better way to distribute the data? That's that's a whole other discussion. But I think you're right that what, what you're talking about is, is, you know, son of GEO or child of GEO or... <laughs> Geo part de or something, and and that's not a bad thing, but we all know what the quality of some of the data is like in geo, and that's not what you'd want to replicate. Oh yeah, so um, to follow up on Ross's point, you know, I think that if you were to go down that path, um, I, I would suggest you really couldn't do it in a very um, in a reasonable way without allocating some of that production money to uh, the, the controls, the standards, and so on, so that other data producers know what to do uh, and know that their data are of sufficient quality to be submitted and accepted. Otherwise, otherwise the, the DAC part of the job will scale out of control. It's better to publish standards for people to be able to validate against those standards it's not, and it's not just uh, published standards, it's the appropriate controls that they can get and test and then know that their data are going to be of sufficient quality and in the right format uh, that they can be accepted and appropriately annotated so that it, it, it doesn't create a lot of extra work for everyone. Are there any other comments about this concept proposal? And if not, I need uh, a motion to uh, approve the concept. Let's ask what, sure. what, are, what are we approving? You're approving um, this as a concept so that NHGRI can then go ahead, develop funding, uh, develop uh, grant application solicitations and uh, and publish them and receive applications. So if this this vote will be approval for NHGRI to go to go ahead and proceed to issue uh, this as a program with the current budget as it was described, or with the modifications that we discussed in council. With the um, budget that was discussed as guideline, as a as a fairly strong guideline, but contingent upon what uh, the actual in, the institute's actual financial situation is when the uh, when the uh, awards are made. But but what about but what about some of the other kinds of modifications, which were not necessarily budget modifications? I mean, there's there's the concept in principle. And then there's where the rubber meets the road. And, and right. the last five minutes or so of discussion were slightly of a modification nature, I thought. 
I'm just trying to understand, which is, I think, what Jeff was trying to do. I think it, as we develop these, we take your um, advice into consideration, and we, we have a reality check of budget numbers, we have a reality of what other activities are going on at the institute and, and in other institutes, and we factor all of those things in um, as we develop these initiatives. We can't go too far in telling you what specifically is going to be in the solicitation because that will potentially disqualify any of you who are interested in applying. So this has been a public discussion. It's the concept. We've heard the issues you've raised. We will take those into account in writing the, uh, the specific solicitation. Um, it won't look... I don't think you'll be particularly surprised by it when it comes out, but um, it may be better because of this uh, discussion. I'll, I'll move approval. <laughs> <laughs> That's a faith-based initiative. I'll, I'll, go, I'll, go, uh, I'll second the motion. <laughs> Is there any further discussion? All in favor of approving the concept? Anybody opposed? Dee Dee, do you want to weigh in? Yes, I approve. Thank you. <laughs>